Hi, I'm Simone W. Johnson Smith, and welcome to the Immigrant Experience in America. Are you a professional new to the United States and struggling to monetize the expertise you brought across the seas? Are you feeling misunderstood and out of touch because you're struggling to understand the unstated rules of the American culture? Each week, we'll take an in-depth look at the positive contributions immigrants are making to the American culture, marketplace, and life. Our intention is to serve as a bridge from your culture to the American culture, giving you a roadmap of tools and the language to understand the unstated rules of the American culture. Let's get started. Welcome to part two of the previous episode. And there is so much to cover because lately I have just been wanting and realizing just how much of our ancestry from Africa. Yes, there's been so much scattering of our people across the world and so much has been lost, but there is so much also that has either been destroyed or stolen or hidden from the African continent and our ancestry that needs to be told because the only view a lot of people have of Africa is poverty, famine. I mean, you hear everybody nowadays saying it's, I I don't really know the true statistics or the the facts about it, but they're saying Africa is the only continent now that is, can like feed the rest of the world because there's so much resources on the continent. But you would never know that because of the portrayal of the continent in the media. And so I'm just hoping that there's more. I saw Idris Elba meeting with the, is it prime minister or president of Ghana recently wanting to bring in some filming into Ghana and other parts of, I think he mentioned South Africa as well. I think it's long overdue for the black world to be portrayed in a positive light and more authentically and the truth about the value and beauty that we add to the world to be really be captured by us right because it's always going to be misconstrued and painted in a certain light when you get other people in there it needs to be led by black people absolutely it will always be you know I had clients that pitched certain shows in the reality space and by the time they were done with it it was a totally different show it was a totally different concept and then even when I was pitching this concept when before I decided to do it myself when I knew this is the moment that I knew I had to do it myself I won't say any names I'm not going to say the network but it is a black owned network and I had to pitch this concept to five I'm just going to be transparent it was five upper middle aged white males and this panel told me that black people did not want to see positive images of other black people that middle class, black, female, college educated, this was their, as I asked them what their demographic was, this was their demographic, middle class, college educated, black, female, age 25 to, to 55, would not be able to relate to seeing educated black people living abroad, sort of, I won't say low cl- conflict because they're high stakes. It's just not that negative formula of black people fighting each other. And they said that they didn't think that that's what the demographic wanted. And I said, well, so you're going to tell me that I won't relate to myself because your demographic is me. Mm-hmm. Your demographic is everyone that I know. And so you panel of upper middle aged white males are going to tell me what we want. That's what happens. They are telling us what we want or what they want us to see, and not always our truth. And we are the best curators and the best navigators of our own narratives. And we have to take charge. You know, it's it's funny because people tell me all the time, oh, your show should be on mainstream television. And I I do count it a success that is on Amazon Prime that, you know, it was accepted because they don't accept everything. It's not YouTube. You can't just put anything (laughs) In terms of getting the show out there, it was something that I knew I had to do as an indie filmmaker because no one else would do it. And then for those who did have a conversation with me and wanted to, they wanted to change it. They wanted to make it into, you know, this sort of ensemble cast that had conflict with one another. And it's not as though our show shies away from conflict. That's not real. You do have misunderstandings in life. And not everybody that you meet on the expat journey you're going to always agree with. 
but it's the way in which we are depicted of how we navigate even the simplest misunderstandings becomes such a toxic stereotype of, of, of how Black women and Black men navigate change and navigate conflict of life that they take it and they pervert it. And I just know of, of so many Black people in, in various cultures that are tired of that, that want some variety. There are plenty of people that love that. There's a show for everyone. The problem with Black-led cast and shows is that we don't have any diversity. We are not monolithic. We don't all handle conflict the same way. And yes, especially in places like Africa. I mean, we're going to Cape Town in Johannesburg next month. I used to do a travel vlog called Where in the World is Juanita? So I'm going to shoot a couple of episodes of that while I'm out there just because if I don't show that experience through my own lens, then you'll continue what the media has done to Africa is paint it as though it is this horribly impoverished, you know, place where you shouldn't want to go. Are there issues in Africa in various countries in Africa? Sure. There are issues in various countries in America. You know, California has one of the highest homeless population statistics in the country. There are problems everywhere. But I think the perversion of those problems and how they're depicted in a particular place. And like you said, the redaction of our own history, the redaction of even where we come from, because in, in landing in America, it's funny, I'm on the show this season, I had a ex cultural exchange scene with one of the indigenous tribe members of Taiwan. Taiwan has indigenous tribes there. And we talked about, and, and I, with one of my friends who is, is Haitian, and we talked about this experience of having your history repressed. Uh, mm -hmm. For a while, Taiwan would not allow the Taiwanese indigenous tribes to, to use their own language, their native language. And it was almost eradicated. One of the members asked me, your grandparents, were they allowed to speak their native tongue? And I said, well, my great grandparents were former slaves. And so, no, our history was intentionally erased when we arrived on the ship. Uh, and I traced my history on my maternal side to the first slave that arrived in the port in Maryland. Amazing. And where she came from, I will never know. I'll have to do an ancestry DNA and trust that that's accurate, but I will never know. We were not allowed to continue with our native language or your tongue will be cut out. You know, it was very barbaric, very harsh, very cruel, very intentional in terms of erasing. Because when you erase history, you erase identity. When you erase identity, you almost tap into purpose and worth. So having the job and, and sort of the responsibility of rebuilding that. I, I love what Idris Elba is doing. I love what a lot of, of Black uh, creators are doing to sort of rebuild the image of African countries. Because for so long, we had the commercials that ran in America, you know, for 99 cents a day, you can help this poor child. And all you saw were poor children who were homeless with flies flying around them. And mm. that was Africa. That was intentional. That was all that you saw. And undoing that narrative will take time. It will take just as much intention that put that narrative into place. It'll take just as much care and time to undo it. But I do believe that there's a strong wave and movement of consciousness and awareness, the same way that there's a strong move and wave and desire to see us in a more diverse, authentic portrayal uh, within the unscripted genre. I'm hoping that this show does uh, what a different world did for us in higher education and how we saw ourselves and opportunity and potential. I hope that this show does for us in normalizing us just being, you know, in, in, in various spaces. So that's the goal. I think we each as creatives have the responsibility and certainly the opportunity to do what we can to make a difference, to put a groove uh, in the stair step, if you will, towards that diverse depiction and honest depiction of Black people. So that's, that's the goal. It's like they're feeding a beast, which is like the, the more graphic, the more aggressive, the more angry, the more, you know, they just go to the extremes on the negative side and then just feed whatever that beast is on the other end. And there's a lot of people who don't want to consume that. I don't want to digest and consume that um, because it's not my real, my authentic experience. 
I'm looking forward to seeing us depicted authentically in other spaces. And there is um, just so a wealth of examples and stories to follow. I don't know why they seem to go after these negative, negative stereotypes to just always feed the American public and the global public about Black people, you know, being depicted in certain ways. And it just, it needs to stop. We're not the only people who have like certain part, groups of us who behave poorly or behave in some of these ways, right? They're not showing, if you were being equal in showing some of these stereotypes that are happening in your own communities, then that would be another story. But you're only depicting your own community in such in a positive light as if you guys don't have conflict, you guys don't have arguments, you guys don't exactly. kill each other. Right. So why exactly. are you depicting one group of people as the only the only folks on the on the planet to have a disagreement? Exactly. That's exactly it. And and honestly, they, you know, you get more of a balanced view. So for example, you know, you you have everything from Duck Dynasty to Honey Boo Boo to Chrisley Knows Best for other groups. But where's the balance? Where's the Chrisley Knows Best for Black people? Where's the balance of us? You know, and I, I pick Chrisley Knows Best because even though they went to jail, I still think in terms of a show, it was an amazing show. Chrisley Knows Best is hilarious. He's funny. His, his family is funny. But it was about his family. It's about his family just navigating life. I want to hang out with the grandmother. I think his granddaughter is amazing. I think his fam- the show dynamic from a technical producing perspective was a brilliant show. It was entertaining. It was fun. But where is our equivalent to your point? You know, you, they, they have on the continuum of life circumstances, they have variety. We do not. Why is that? What is the agenda in doing that? Why is that being done? And what happens when that is being done is that to the majority of the world, then when you continue to only show us in one vein, in one light, then you create the stereotype that is not only insulting, it's dangerous because that is often how we are mishandled in global settings. Yes. Because you assume that everything, if I, I I'll never forget one time I was in a, a taxi I was in Taiwan and I mean, the guy, he had said something. Oh, we were getting in the car and he didn't check to see if we were the right people and we didn't check the license tag. So we got in the wrong car and he was about to take off. And, we, and I said, oh, we're going to this place. And he said, oh, wait, you're, you're in the wrong car. I said, oh, I'm sorry. And the way that he snapped. And we couldn't, it's almost like we couldn't say anything. Even I'm sorry was taken as hostile. Why is that? You know, why is it that as soon as I open my mouth, you assume that there's some hostility with it. And all I was doing was trying to apologize. Mm -hmm. I think in society, in the world, we are being mishandled, misjudged because our humanity has, has been extrapolated from us as human beings. And when you remove humanity from a, a group of people, That's how you can put your knee down on the neck of somebody for eight minutes until they die on camera and then still have a question about whether or not it was justified, whether or not it was or wasn't okay. That's how that happens. And I know it sounds extreme, but it's not. Because when you put forth these these stereotypes become dangerous, it removes an act of humanity from an entire group of people. You paint them one dimensional. You remove any kind of ability to relate to them. Because who can relate to only one dimension of a particular group? You, it's not relatable. You relate to other people. It's, it's funny because the American Bar Association for Attorneys years ago came up with this phrase for black women. And they did a study as to why black attorney, female attorneys were not making partner. They weren't going on to higher positions in companies. And they called it the living room locker room factor. And that is absent for black women in the sense that there's no living room factor with the majority of those who are in power being white males. So there's no living room factor in the sense that I don't remind you of someone that would be sitting in your living room. I don't remind you of your mother, your sister, your aunt, a friend, somebody that would sit in your living room. There's no locker room factor because there's no male commonality. You know, we're not going to sit in the locker room and talk about sports. So there's no gender commonality of maleness in, in how they relate to us. 
So you get that and then you get a group of people that is just extremely unrelatable to them. When you remove that, you remove empathy, you remove the ability to, to see yourself in their shoes, you remove humanity. And when you do that, it becomes dangerous because it's, they become objects and things and not people. Part of my struggle has been, I came into this country after high school, but I have struggled, Juanita, to fit in with the native Black American population. Mm. And I speak too proper. I'm trying to be white. If I do my studies, if I, if I go to school and do what I'm supposed to do, I'm trying to be white. If I go to work and I speak to everybody, I'm not in support of the Black people because I'm speaking to the white folks in the office. I am so confused. I'm so confused. I mean, like, I, I mean, can you not walk into a space and have purity of spirit to just be experience everyone in that space? You have to now like be on a certain side. If I don't speak a certain way, then I'm not accepted. I'm not, I'm not black or it's, it's been quite a journey. I have to tell you, and I'm really concerned about my daughter being raised here because I don't know the fact that we've been able to send her to private school, like what sort of group are they going to put her in? Is she going to now be stereotypes of uh, stereotype of uh, trying to be white or something else just because she speaks proper or she, she's smart. I mean, it's it just like this underlying tone of like, you know, what, why does black have to be equated to mediocre? In my mind, I'm like, who has she been hanging around? I've never had, it was so weird is that I've, I've heard this before what city were you in? I've just never experienced yeah. that. And as you can hear, from, I, that's just not my norm. That's not because, I mean, nobody gets to be a corporate expat without an extreme level of professionalism and aptitude in terms of their career. So I don't know of any Black people that hold those values. Every corporate Black person that I know. But then again, now, mind you, I am in spaces with vice president and and directors and lawyers and doctors, I don't know of Black people that really truly hold that mindset and that ideal any more than, like I said, you know, there's there's a, if if you want to believe that Yardie is the only genre or the only culture of that which is Jamaican, you'd be poorly mistaken, you know? Right. But right. I don't, but some people, that's all that they experience. I've never experienced that. And I don't think that I speak with a particular vernacular that would be considered urban, per se. I mean, I came from inner city in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I don't have a single friend that I've grown up with in high school. In my high school, we still travel together. We still hang out with each other. Socioeconomically, we are very diverse in where we are in life. I've never had anyone say you're talking white. Never. I've never heard anyone say that. I don't know if it was a different aspect that they were picking. I don't know, because I can't speak to your experience. Where were you growing up? Like, I just, I'm so curious. Like, where did this happen? I spent part of my time in, in Kansas City, Missouri. And I just remember being on campus and trying to really just be a part of the Black Student Union and just not being accepted. And then I moved to the D.C. area. Mm -hmm. um, and then I lived in Philadelphia for a short stint there. And, and then I lived in Atlanta for a, a period there. And I tell you, it has been, I have never felt accepted. And really? I, and I was even talking to one of my older Jamaican uh, uh, lady friends. And she was telling me how when her son was in school, she realized that when he was in high school, it's as if his white friends or friends of other ethnicities would not accept him until he started acting thuggish and started talking in a certain manner. Like if he spoke too proper, they didn't know where to place him, right? And it's like, that's what they were fed from the media. And so he started mm -hmm. behaving in a certain way. And she's like, why are you speaking like that? Or why are you behaving this way? This is not you. But it's as if they have this perception of what Blackness is supposed to be and you have to fit into that or they're uncomfortable with you. And it's not just with other Black folks. I... I've had white folks not know what to do with me because I speak Spanish or that I speak, you know, I, you know, I'm educated. They don't know what box to put you in. Yeah. Or even like recently had an experience with a Mexican girl who we went to, um, 
we went to South Carolina and we went to one of the plantations and they had a film that they filmed like um, this movie there. So it was pretty popular, like a huge, huge property. And I mean, they actually wanted me to kind of walk around in pity. I don't really have that experience. And it's, it's just like, I just, I don't get that. I'm like, I'm not going to walk around being angry as a black person. And you expecting me to walk around, just be angry because of slavery, because I don't know, I didn't have that within me. And I guess they were expecting me to, to express that. And it was just, it was so weird to me about the, the expectation of other groups that I have to fit into a certain stereotype of blackness. I had to, you know, like if, if I, if I came into a room and I was too joyful or happy or excited because of an achievement, or if I show that I'm smart, it's like, that this you like you get like this vitriol from people like you're supposed to be quiet and I don't I never really got that it's just it's crazy um but this is how through my lens I'm experiencing blackness I'm experiencing blackness and I'm like where is this coming from like you know and, and I mean it probably goes to the whole what people are watching on tv and this is what they expect you to behave as and so what you, your work and what you're doing will definitely change the light of how just black people in general around the world are being viewed and portrayed. I hope so. And I, I think too, sometimes and it's interesting because when we were doing the, uh, when Black Lives Matter was happening, we showed that in season one and Taiwan had this rally and I was actually working with the founders of the Black Lives Matter Taiwan movement and they decided not to move forward because of this reason of what you're expressing in the sense that everybody's blackness is not the same. And so we had a lot of people who were of the Caribbean descent and came from the Caribbean islands and they expressed, and it's funny, I had a conversation just like this with someone in Taiwan. It'll come to my mind what country she was from. It wasn't St. Lucia or was it? It was one of the Caribbean islands. Her expression was the same in the sense that she said, you know, with Black Lives Matter is so American African-American centric and what you're focused on and the causes that you have. I don't identify with the pain. I don't identify with the anger. I'm not angry about that. That's not my experience. That's not my plight. And what I explained to her, or we had this conversation and we met on a commonality. I think sometimes, and I can't speak to the situation because I, I wasn't there and I don't know, and nuances matter. And this, I'm sure it's a very layered experience in terms of what you have experienced. Sometimes I think as uh, Black Americans or African Americans, it's twofold. One, we need to understand that our Black is, is not universal and that everybody doesn't share our Black experience and that what our hardships are not the hardships to be born on everyone. We can't center ourselves in the movement for everybody. Second part of that, though, is there is a, a hope and a desire for a shared relatability to be opposed to anti-Blackness. And I think as opposed to being specific about, oh, you know, feeling the pain of being at a plantation, and that's not something that you can identify with because that's not your experience. Whereas when I step on a plantation, I think about which one of my ancestors, ancestors hung from what tree. I do. Mm. But that's because I know that they did. I've traced my lineage. So I know that slavery was a part of my experience. However, what is born out of that period of time, whether you were a part of that period of time or not. Now, I wasn't a part of Windrush, you know, in the UK. That has nothing to do with me in mm -hmm. particular. But what undergirds all of it is a commonality of white supremacy and anti-Blackness mm -hmm. that I would hope that we could all find and identify with being against that because that impacts everyone. So while it is not realistic to have an expectation that you would step on a plantation and feel anything other than, you know, I go to, I went to Cambodia and there was this huge travesty that was visited upon the Cambodian people. Um, it was an insurgent. They were killing their own people. And there's a place where you can go in Cambodia where there are skulls and bones of the people who were killed. I've gone to Holocaust museums. I'm not Jewish. That has nothing to do with me. But when I step 
in those spaces? Is there a part of my humanity that feels pained because mm. of the anguish that was visited upon humanity? Right. And the undergirding theme of all of that is anti-blackness and white supremacy and anti-humanity. Do I feel anger because of that? Absolutely. Do I identify then with the anti-blackness that was present for certain things to occur, certain atrocities to occur amongst other black people that have nothing to do with me? I completely understand and I think it's just now that the brutality of the systems that have existed here, that I think a lot of people who come in and other Blacks who come into the United States are not educated on the reality of what that was like, right? Yeah. It is literally just in the last five years that I have realized just how systemic racial issues were. Like Because for me, when I first came in and somebody would be mean to me, I it's not a conversation that we grew up having, like literally there is colorism in the Caribbean, but yeah. I don't think the type of racial conversations and stuff that we see here happens on our TV or in our everyday conversations. And so for me, I would first jump to, oh, this person is rude or mean. And I'm like, and I would say, I would literally would remember saying to myself, that's your problem if you don't like me. And I would just be on my way. I realized just how systemic the issues that I was feeling and couldn't put my finger on. I couldn't find yeah. the words. I couldn't find the explanation. I just knew that when I walked into the workplace or when I walked into certain spaces and that I wasn't invited into certain circles, I knew something was there. But see, we don't have the language for it. And it's not that we don't relate. It's literally, honestly, because we don't have the narrative to explain what is this thing that I'm experiencing? I know something is wrong. And it's not until we have the conversations with you guys, or if we go to a HSBCU and we're educated about what the American reality is, now we start putting language to it. And so it's not yeah. that I couldn't, is be, I'm still trying to find the language to explain some of yeah. the experiences and people's expectations about how I'm supposed to be. But I understand our experiences as Blacks are interlinked. We have to support each other. We have to come together because if we don't, we can't, how can we trust anybody else if we can't trust each other? Um, and I think as Black Americans, we have to also broaden our knowledge and scope in terms of understanding that Black is different in different groups and different cultures. The experiences are different. Um, and understanding that we can't center ourselves, center our pain, center our experience in everybody else's life and everybody else's experience. That's just not realistic either. So I think that that's one of the things that we have to, we all have to do, you know, in terms of, of relating to one another and having that common experience and being so, like support flows both ways. I will say that it, it it flows both ways in terms of our ability. You know, the conversation that I had um, in Taiwan with my friend helped me to see that she didn't relate to the Black Lives Matter movement in the same way and vein that I did. But what we did have in commonality was the acknowledgement of what I, I talked about, you know, this idea and concept of, of anti-Blackness being the real issue and something that we could relate on. But in Taiwan, we decided not to have a Black Lives Matter Taiwan um, and call it that because there were so many other issues that were not American centric. That if you're going to deal with the issues for Black people globally, you have to acknowledge cultural differences. You have to acknowledge exactly what we're talking about today. And we all have to come to a meeting place in the middle to acknowledge that it is different. That's the first place to start is to know that. And, and that doesn't mean that you don't belong. I think maybe I don't. And again, I don't know what the experience was, but sometimes I think as as black Americans, we can pick up on that. You don't have language for it. What we misconstrue is not having language for it or not being able to articulate it doesn't mean that you don't acknowledge it. It doesn't mean that you don't see it. It doesn't mean that you are not supportive, it means that you have a different experience and different doesn't necessarily mean that you are not supportive. It just, yeah. we have to broaden our lens and scope. But then at the same time for us, our reality is understanding 
what you all have come to experience, nobody else is going to make that distinction. So because we are so accustomed to Black being Black, not because it is common or because it is all the same, because it is not, we fully know that. It is how the world handles you. They do not make that distinction for you. They don't give you the benefit of being Jamaican over being anything else. To them and to the world, Black is Black. So when you get pulled over by a police officer, they're not going to be like, oh, you're Nigerian? Let me cut you some slack. No, Black is Black. That's yeah. unfortunate. But I think the commonality that we all have in our very diverse Black experience and, and being part of the diaspora is that anti-Blackness is something that is a common problem. How that plays out in the various lives is, is very, very different. I wish you had had a different experience. Again, I have never had any of my friends say, oh, I've, I've heard people say that, that they feel like Black Americans can come across sometimes as, oh, you're talking white or you're you're not Black enough. And what why does Black connote that? I just never experienced I that. I literally that. had a colleague say to me, she acts so Black. She said it to my face. I'm telling you, this stuff you know, is happening. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's funny because on, on the show, one of my cast members was uh, a Black woman. She was uh, Scottish. She was Black, but she was from Scotland. And I told her, I was like, I've been to Scotland. I didn't know it was that many Black people there. Uh, I didn't see none of y'all when I'm with them. She was born <laughs> and raised there. I was like, really? They're Black, Scottish people? Cool. You know, and but she she said to me, she was like, Juanita, you are so Black. <laughs> she was like, I mean, you are like really in touch with your blackness and you're just so embracing of your identity as being black. And, and when she said that, I was like, thank you. you know, I don't know what else to say yeah. to that. She was like, no, it's very different. She was like, at the same time, you're so balanced and, and open to other people. And so I think she too had felt not being able to feel like she fit in, in. And maybe that is my HBCU experience in the sense of uh, when I when I went to get my law degree, I went to a predominantly white school for law school. And it was a culture shock for me to not mm. be around that many black people. And I didn't feel like I fit in. It was it was necessary because that was, you know, what I was going to experience in the world. But I had never been in, a, in an environment where I didn't fit in in an environment that wasn't embracing. Because I went to, I was explaining this to my Black Scottish friend, because she was like, what is your background? And I'm like, well, I went to an all-Black nursery school, an all-Black elementary, an all-Black middle school, and an all-Black high school. Then I went to an HBCU. So my entire world was that of very diverse Blackness. My mother is an educator. My dad is a vice chancellor at a university and a CFO. I just grew up with this sort of black intelligentsia environment, as did all of my friends. But socioeconomically, I grew up, you know, I won't say I was from the hood, but I was adjacent, like hood adjacent, you know? <laughs> like right there, kind of <laughs> sort of uh, hood enough. Yeah, I just I don't know. But I never someone speaking in a particular way again now I'm a lawyer so I just you know in certain regards I just have professionalism certainly is replete within my experiences I never saw black people view other black people in that way in the right. sense that you're you're talking white but I have heard it too many times to not believe it I just feel like where on earth are they still doing that it goes into our perceptions of ourselves and what we've been indoctrinated with in terms of how we even see ourselves. Again, I created, and people often ask me like, who did you create the show for? I didn't really create the show to, to necessarily change the minds of um, non-Black people because um, that's not our job. I don't feel, I feel like we're exhausted and that's not our job anymore. And if people choose to, feed into certain stereotypes and that's their choice. Is that a byproduct of the show? Sure. Is it very important? Absolutely. But my first primary audience was to change how we see ourselves and to give us the options of seeing ourselves in a variety of different spaces because you have to have your own sense of self-identity first. That's what matters the most. It's the same as in relationship. You teach other people how to treat you. The relationship with yourself matters the most. And I think that as Black people, that's very, very true. 
Join us next week for part three of this episode. Tune in next week for another episode of The Immigrant Experience in America. As this is a new podcast, we welcome any and all support. If you have not done so already, subscribe on the Apple Podcast app, Google Podcast app, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. You can also support us by completing a five-star rating and review and sharing our podcast with your friends, family, and circle of influence.